So I'm writing a biography of, of Joseph Roth or Joseph Roth, as he would have said it, but I think we can anglicize this to Joseph Roth. That's what I'm going to say. Um, my book is due to be published in the UK next year. There's no US publisher as yet. Maybe that will change, who knows. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes or so. I'm going to say a little about Roth, a little about why I'm writing the book, and then I'd like to give some biographical context to Job, and then we'll come to discuss the novel itself. So a potted biography of, of, of Joseph Roth. Um, I've just written about 150,000 words trying to tell his story. I'm still not sure I've quite covered everything, so to sum it up in a couple of minutes is bound to be inadequate, but I'll do my best. Joseph Roth, 1894 to 1939, an author who wrote over a dozen novels and novellas, several works of non-fiction, thousands of wonderful newspaper articles, not straight news reports, but feuilletons, poetic and personal reflections on his travels and the politics of his time, most of them published in the Frankfurter Zeitung in the 1920s and 30s. He was raised by his mother, um, Maria, if we could have the next image, please. Thank you. And he never knew his father, who went insane before he was born. So this image is, is Maria, Maria Grubel, she was born. Um, this, the loss of his father to insanity was the first great loss of a life that was, excuse me, shaped by a staggering series of losses and blows. The second defining loss was that of the Habsburg monarchy. If we could have our third image. This is Emperor Franz Joseph. Uh, uh, the loss of the Habsburg monarchy and the Austro-Hungarian Empire that he grew up under, which collapsed at the end of the First World War. Roth has been described as the great elegist of the cosmopolitan, tolerant and doomed Central European culture that flourished in the dying days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he was a man who lost his father, then his fatherland, and spent much of his time mourning these cosmic gaps in his life and attempting to fill them. He was born Moses Joseph Roth in a predominantly Jewish town called Brody. If we could have a next image, please. And this is the Brody Synagogue, which lay on the eastern edge of the empire near the Russian border, much like Zuknau in Job. This is one of many examples of shuttles in his fiction that are models to some degree on his hometown. Back then it was part of Galicia, now it's in Ukraine. I went there a couple of years ago. Next image, please. And this shows you the ruins of the synagogue today. Um, I'll say a little bit more about my trip to Brody uh, later on. It's about an hour east of Lviv or Lemberg as it was in the Austrian era. He grew up with his mother and her father, Yechiel Grubel. Next image, please. Uh, Yechiel's wife died young in childbirth, and perhaps it was grief that turned his hair white in his late twenties, the age when he sat for this portrait. That and his arduous life as a cloth merchant who bought his goods in England and sold them to tailors in Galicia. He was also a Jewish scholar who studied under an eminent conservative Brody rabbi named Solomon Kluger. I mention these details of Yechiel Grubel's life because I think that to an extent he forms the model for the beleaguered, prematurely aged Mendel Singer in Job. The ambitious Joseph Roth left provincial Brody as soon as he could, first for university in Lemberg. Next image, please. And this is Roth as a student. And then he transferred his studies to Vienna. Then he served in the First World War. He would tell people he had fought at the Eastern Front, been decorated for his bravery, and bravely escaped from a Siberian prisoner of war camp. In truth, he largely spent the war as a military censor in Lemberg. He was a compulsive self-fictionalizer and fantasist. He spent much of the 1920s in Vienna, Paris, and Berlin. Those were his bases anyway. He was in perpetual motion, traveling all around Europe, filing dispatches from the south of France, Rome, Albania, Russia, Poland, all over Germany. It was a frenetic, exhausting lifestyle, but he'd have been bored to death by anything else. By the turn of the decade, he was one of the best paid journalists in Europe, and yet he was perpetually broke for various reasons. 
One, he was by then a heavy drinker. Two, having grown up in near poverty, he had a taste for fine living and liked to stay in the finest hotels. Three, he was immensely generous. And even when he had no money, he was catching funds off rich friends like Stefan Zweig. Next image, please. That's Zweig and, and Roth together in Ostend in 1936. Even then, he would go on to share the money out with other equally hard up friends. And fourth, most poignantly and pertinently for this story, his wife, Friederike, or Friedel, as she was known, succumbed to schizophrenia and he had to work incessantly to raise the money to cover her expensive psychiatric care. Next image, please. And that is Friedel. Then in 1933, as Hitler took power, Roth left Berlin for the last time. He got on a train out of Berlin pretty much as soon as Hitler took control, and he never returned. From that point on, he also lost his German publishers and readers. His books were burned. He was a banned author, and he was published by small Dutch presses who published emigre writers. He made Paris his home for the last six years of his life, a life drastically shortened by his alcoholism. He died a horrible alcoholic's death in a Parisian pauper's hospital in May 1939. Some of his friends felt he needn't have died then if he'd received better care, but really he was in such a parlous physical and mental state that he surely could not have lived much longer, and perhaps it was better that he didn't live to see what the next five years would bring. A few words on why I'm writing this book. I first read Roth about 20 years ago, when his non-fiction work, The Wandering Jews, was first published in English, translated by Michael Hoffman, who has translated almost all Roth's works over the past three decades, and to whom Anglophone readers owe a debt of thanks. I'm pleased to be using Michael's translations in my book because they're really beautifully done. Job, incidentally, you may have spotted, is not translated by him, but by Dorothy Thompson. Or you may have one of the other translations, but hers is the most popular and commonest. This is one of the few English translations from Roth's lifetime, and it still stands up well, so there was no need for Michael to translate it as part of his, his program of translating almost everything that Roth has written. Having read Roth then, he always kind of fascinated me, but it was only four years ago when I was looking for a new biographical subject after my last book that I happened on the idea of writing this book. I was Googling him. I read a newspaper article by Michael Hoffman that accompanied his translation of Roth's collected letters. And in it, Hoffman said there was no English biography of him and that these letters would serve as his biography. So I thought I'd have a go at doing something about that. He seemed a surprisingly major writer not to have been written about at length in English. Further to that, a few slight personal associations of the sort that help a biographer feel some motivating connection, however spurious with their subject. For one thing, my maternal great-grandparents were Bohemian and Galician Jews. For instance, my great-grandfather, Mendel Meller, was from a Galician shtetl called Mostiska, about an hour west of Brody. He moved from there to Vienna around the time of the First World War, like so many Ostjuden, and that's where my grandfather was born. A couple of years ago, when I visited Brody, I also made a day trip to Mostiska. Next image, please becoming the first member of my family to return there in a century, which I found very moving. This is a not very good photograph taken by the tour guide I hired of me standing by the Mostiska town sign. Um, I wish she'd taken it from a bit closer, but there we are. Um, Mostiska, like Brody, like Zucknell, was a town of muddy streets, slum housing, wooden plank sidewalks, market traders living on next to nothing, men in hats and kaftans, boys with payers, studying in Kedas, a self-contained world and a lost world captured in the photographs of Roman Vishniak. There's a quote about the Ostjuden I like from Rabbi Abraham Heschel. He said, tenaciously adhering to their own traditions, they were bent upon the cultivation of what was most their own to the utter disregard of the outside world. Literature for them was writing by Jews and for Jews. They did not apologize to anyone nor did they compare themselves with anyone else. In Eastern Europe, the Jewish people had come into its own. It did not live like a guest in somebody else's house, 
who must constantly keep in mind the ways and customs of his host. The Jews lived in their own way, without reservation and without disguise, outside their homes no less than within them. This is relevant because after the collapse of his marriage to Friedel, Roth began increasingly to retreat in his fiction to sketching out a nostalgic world of shtetl living, a place where Jews lived authentic Jewish lives on their own terms as part of a tolerant multinational Habsburg empire, where time and again, he sets his stories in towns that were models on Brody. The first half of Job is the first fully realized iteration of the homeland Roth built in his imagination. His previous novels from the 1920s held a mirror to Weimar society. This one is a painting of the past rendered in accentuated color. Every twist prior to the mir miraculous ending takes the singer family into darker and sadder territory. But Roth's prose has a dreamy, luxuriant quality. You sense, I think, that the writing itself was a withdrawal, that respite lay in conjuring an alternate world, a refuge to revisit at will, created in what the critic Wolf Marchand termed as an Ausdruck einer fortschreitenden Realitätsflucht, the expression of a growing flight from reality. Job is the first time he really does that, and he does it again and again afterwards, from the Radetzky March to Weights and Measures to the Emperor's Tomb. It's also relevant because Roth was deeply shaped by the world he left behind and by the Hasidim he grew up around in Brody. He would later make reference to his, as he puts it, inner Hasid, who toyed with the idea that Friedel's madness was possession by a Dibuk. Another little tangential connection concerns Friedel, who grew up in Leopoldstadt in Vienna. And next image, please. The family's address was Amtaba 15. At this time in the 1920s and 30s, my grandmother, Ilse Epstein, and her sister, Lisbeth, lived almost directly opposite at Amtaba 22 with their parents, Arnold and Edith. The Epsteins remained there until they had to flee in the late 30s. The Reichlers, Friedel's family, were there until 1935. It seems quite possible that the families knew of each other. Perhaps my ancestors were even acquainted with Roth, owing to his regular visits to the apartments across the streets. There's no way of knowing as they're all long gone. Lisbeth is the only one I knew. She lived later in San Francisco and she died in 1996 when I was 18. But his world was my ancestors' world, and in learning about him, I learned something about them too. Okay, so now a few observations on the interrelation between Job and Roth's life at the time he was writing it. The book was published in 1930. The immediate context is his marriage ending amidst Friedel's descent into schizophrenia, which began in 1928 after some years of depression and unusual behaviour. Next image, please. At the beginning of 1930, Roth arranged for Friedel, and this picture shows them together, to move from her parents' home in Vienna to his friend Stefan Fingels in Berlin, where they would stay together. There, with her in bed in the next room, Roth worked on a story that examined his despair at her condition, yet risked, risked exacerbating it by putting her decline into the public domain in thinly disguised form. Roth would acknowledge that the character of Miriam Singer, Mendel's daughter, who goes insane, was modelled on Friedel. A psychiatric report mentions sexual arousal among Friedel's symptoms. There is no indication that she was promiscuous or cheated on Roth, but this seems to be the seed of Miriam's promiscuity in the novel. I think that here he's actually doing something rather malicious, he often did which was to get back at people who were causing him strife in real life by portraying them in his fiction as they would least wish or deserve to be portrayed. He knew all too well that the material in Job was dangerously close to home. I think he felt immensely conflicted between his desire to help his wife, whom he adored, and a resentment towards her for the constraints her declining mental health had placed on his precious liberty in the past five years. As great as it was, his desire to help her was also outweighed by his compulsion to work through their situation on the page. So he went ahead and published a book that he hoped might raise the funds for psychiatric help to alleviate Friedel's suffering, while knowing full well that if she were to read it, this was likely to undermine his, her parents, and the medical profession's efforts to help her. Friedel had better not read my book, 
he told her mother. It describes how Miriam becomes mentally ill and she will understand that. As long as she remains in this spiteful mood and is angry with everyone, she will unfortunately remain ill and you can't trust her with everything. Perhaps it will do her harm if she reads my book. That's from a letter that he wrote to Friedel's parents in 1930. There are sections of the book that directly mirror the couple's real life experiences. In Job, when Miriam goes insane, a doctor comes. We will have to take her to a sanatorium, the doctor says. He forcibly anaesthetizes her and stretcher bearers arrive by ambulance to take her away. At the institution, a doctor tells Mendel she has suffered a degenerative psychosis. He says, it can pass, but it can also appear as an illness which we physicians call dementia, dementia precox, but even the name is uncertain. Anyhow, it is one of the rare cases that we can do little for. Excuse me. This reflects exactly what was happening to Friedel by early 1930. She began refusing to eat. Her weight plummeted to five stone. She was too weak to move and had to be carried away on a stretcher to an expensive sanatorium at Rickerwinkel, a few miles west of Vienna. The scene sounds near identical to Miriam's hospitalization. At the dawn of the new decade then, Roth found himself immersed in a reprise of his life's original defining loss, that of his father to insanity, and fearful of a worse one to come, that of his own mind. He was utterly desperate and he had embarked on the heavy drinking that would kill him nine years later. He and Stefan Fingal decided to try a different approach to the medical help that was so far getting nowhere. They brought in a Berlin miracle rabbi who proposed to drive out the demons that had taken possession of Friedel's mind. He failed. What we see in Job is the desperation of a family hoping that a miracle will reverse their misfortunes in a way that Roth dearly happened, would ha dearly hoped would happen for him and Friedel, but never would happen. In Job, though, there's an important distinction. Although a miracle comes to save Menuchim, it's a scientific miracle, a breakthrough, a breakthrough enacted by a doctor in St. Petersburg. This, to me, is Roth arguing with his inner Hasid and urging faith in rationalism, modern science and progress, not in superstitions and the abilities of wonder rabbis. At this time, he was so despairing of the medical profession's attitude towards schizophrenic patients um, that he read extensively through the medical journals and developed a detailed understanding of the latest research. And he wrote newspaper articles in which he set out his frustration at the sorry state of institutional psychiatric care. Though characteristically for Roth, who often used his journalism to analyze issues that were affecting his private life, he never mentions in the articles any personal connection to the subject. There's no mention of why he has been visiting psychiatric hospitals and speaking with doctors. I think in Job, with the science, with the medical cure for Miriam's condition, there's a certain amount of wish fulfillment going on there on Roth's part because this was what he was so desperately hoping to see, but failing to see in real life. It's also a book that almost like, uh, like almost all of Roth's is defined by the First World War. The book's first words tell us that Mendelssinger lived, and I quote, many years ago, but we soon gather the story actually begins about 20 years before Roth wrote it, not so long ago. What he means by many years ago is before the First World War, the temporal rift that divided him from a remote prelapsarian era before his world collapsed. The war intervenes, as it always does in Roth, to derail lives and destroy families. One of Mendel's sons, Jonas, signs up to fight with the Cossacks. The other, Shemariah, or later Sam, flees to America, and the family uproot themselves to follow him there. As you know, they leave behind Menuchim, but so indirectly, the war severs the Singer family in two, and that's even before Sam signs, to, signs up to fight for the USA and is killed. The war informed the way that Roth writes about Menuchim's disability. In 1924, he wrote a brilliant, chilling newspaper article describing a macabre funeral parade in Lemberg. The funeral was for a prominent campaigner for ex-servicemen who had been crippled in the war 
and many of those in the parade were grotesquely injured men. Roth describes their injuries in graphic terms. For instance, there is one man of whom he writes, the head sat very loosely, a heavy pumpkin on a thin chain of withered skin flaps. Horrible, but awful um, graphic description. Now, six years later, when he writes of Menuchim, Roth's description of his disability plainly derives from this. His great skull hung heavy as a pumpkin on his thin neck, he says. The war had an immense impact on Roth's world and shaped the way he wrote his novels, not least Job. It's a book that reflects Roth's tortured attitude towards Jewish assimilation. I am going to use this word despite what Michael said earlier, because this is how I tend to think of it, but I do take on board your reservations about the word as well. Um, he once described himself to his friend Soma Morgenstern as suffering from a condition he called assimilitis, which he did not exactly define, but I would take to mean the internal suffering occasioned by feeling that he had sacrificed something authentic of himself so as to integrate into Gentile society in Vienna and Berlin. He knew very well the loss of self entailed in assimilation. It's transactional, and it was a question of whether it was outweighed by the gains of social acceptance within an anti-Semitic milieu such as 1920s Berlin or Vienna, which was, of course, provisional on sustaining the acts. Assimilitis, I think, was the psychological pain of spending your life trying to be someone that deep down you don't feel quite rings true, hiding your original self for your own safety's sake. Think back for a moment to that Abraham Heschel quote about the Eastern Jews being able to live on their own terms. Roth is always contradictory and at times he expressed disdain for the unassimilated Ostjuden he'd grown up among. He despaired of their separation, their backwardness as he saw it, but at other times he expressed admiration for their authenticity, the fact that they didn't sacrifice their true identity for social gain. Roth despised nationalism, Zionism, and any form of separatism. He really had any, he really had a problem with anyone walling themselves off, erecting barriers between themselves and others. And I think this is where some of his, uh, some of his anti-Semitism, because he was sadly quite anti-Semitic at times, I think it's where some of that came from. He felt that the Eastern Jews were stuck in a ghetto of their own making and were too content to be there. He was for assimilation. And yet, because nothing is ever entirely straightforward with him, he also rather envied their authenticity, the fact that they didn't act out a role, whereas he did. He tried to adopt a persona that would advance him in Gentile society in Vienna and Berlin, and it was psychologically exhausting for him. Growing up in Brody, he also absorbed the Ostjud and the, the Hasidim's ideas about the occurrence of miracles, about God's palpable presence and, in abil and ability to intervene in the world. And he would carry these ideas into his adult life for all that they conflicted with the modern thinking he encountered in Vienna, Berlin and Paris. So he was always wrangling with the benefits and perils of assimilation. And I think this plays out in the generation gap between the from self-contained Mendel who quakes at the thought of the Cossacks and his children Miriam sleeps with Cossacks, Jonas joins their army. These are brutal symbols of assimilation that shake the foundations of Mendel's world. Sex and the military, one creates new life, the other deals in death, the very parameters of existence. Mendel, I think, could not feel more fundamentally betrayed. It's also a book, like so many of Roth's, that is shaped by his preoccupation with fathers and sons, which was born of the fact that he never knew his father. Nachum Roth, as I mentioned, went insane before Joseph Roth was born. He spent the next 16 years living in the care of a wonder rabbi who never managed to heal him. They never met. The father's absence was a gaping hole in Joseph Roth's life. Again and again in his fiction, we see sons who resent their father's incompetence, distance, absence, who blame the father's generation for causing the First World War and ruining the world, and so on. Roth has a palpable need for a father's care. I think this is nowhere demonstrated more vividly than, it, than in that remarkable image towards the end of Job, where Mendel Singer is miraculously reuni reunited with his formerly disabled son, Menuchem, and the son picks up the father and sits him on his lap 
The novels are littered with these scenes where the adult Roth is plainly fantasizing about having a father to look after him as if he were still a little boy. As he writes there, Mendel and Alexis embrace, no one speaks, the children silently cry. Alexis lifts Mendel and seats him on his lap like a child. The father has become the son. Mendel looks into his, his friend's faces and whispers the rabbi's prophecy. Pain will make him wise, ugliness good, bitterness mild, and sickness strong. And so to the end of Job, Roth is working through his own issues. The loss of his wife, wife to schizophrenia, the devastating impacts the war had on him and his wider world, his nostalgia for the shuttle hometown he had abandoned, and his yearning for the paternal care that he never had. <laughs>